Anime 5e, let me talk a little bit about that first. So this is, as I mentioned, it's on Kickstarter right now. Anime5e.com is the website URL you can go to. And this particular title is kind of a way to expand out what 5th edition, what Dungeons & Dragons offers and bring in some anime flair as well as a bit of a change in the approach on how it's handled from a, a point-based system. So Dungeons & Dragons being very powers-based is what I would call. So it's you would have, for example, a magic missile, a lightning bolt, and a fireball it would be, say, three spells that all kind of do a similar thing in the sense that they do damage on the opponent. Whereas in say, Anime 5e, you would have a weapon and then you can modify it with some uh, enhancements or limiters. And I'm, tr I'm trying not to use too much game lingo, uh, but what you can do is you would create a weapon ability and that weapon can be can take the form of fire or can take the form of lightning or whatnot so we give you the tools to create the base and then you determine what the effect is going to be that's what we call an effects based system and so there's kind of the two big differences between effects based and power based power based prescribes kind of exactly what something is so if someone has flight as an example they will say flight is from wings and that is the power based where an effects base says you have flight and then you determine why you can fly so it might be racial it might be wings it might be magical ability or psionics or anti-gravity or or whatnot and so that's one of the approaches that we're bringing into anime 5e is giving players an opportunity to define a little bit about where their source of their powers are going to be. So even in, in standard, say, fifth edition with you know, dwarves having might have a resistance to uh, a poisons or you might have elves are resistant to sleep. And those are, say, racial abilities. So they already have some of that in there. But of course, with Anime 5e, because it's a little more broad in terms of what you can do, you can expand it out and, and have many, many different sources for that. So uh, just looking at, uh, uh, it seems like we have a, a question here. So uh, Pascal, thank you very much. It's not a question so much as looking for getting a chance to doing Anime 5e. And we're super excited to, to get it out to the crowd. I mean, I grew up with Dungeons & Dragons. That was the first game, the old red box set back when I was in well, grade seven or eight, um, playing it with friends and, and conquering dragons and going into dungeon crawls. And that was quite the experience for me. That opened my eyes to what role-playing was. Uh, advanced a few years, and I started playing uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, second edition in particular, and that was my my kind of my first real introduction to role-playing. And the Cognac Oak Smasher was my, was my dwarf that I had. And I fell in love with it in high school. And then as time progressed, and I got to university, and then I got introduced to Amber Dice's role-playing. And that suddenly changed my perspective completely on what role-playing could be. So... D and D is still very much you know close to my heart, and Fifth Edition uh, is one of the the better versions certainly of D and D. I mean, I, I have old throwback uh, memories of Thaco and and weapon speeds and all the things from Second Edition, and even from the First Edition box set. The uh, that that has a lot of fond memories, but in terms of a of a package of actual rules, I think that that Fifth Edition is an amazing. D, D presentation a lot of really good streamlining uh certainly uh i mean i kind of didn't know too much about fourth edition but going from third edition i think fifth edition is a far better version of dungeons and dragons than third edition was even and so when i was looking at after doing big eyes small mouth who best on fourth edition it certainly made sense that if i was going to bring in this type of approach i guess from a point-based balancing from an effects-based balancing if i was going to bring it into hitting the dungeons and dragons crowd again which is you know where i got started it certainly made sense to, to do it off fifth edition where the last time i guess best in d20 which some of you may be familiar with was based on three or 3.5 we skipped four completely i wasn't in the industry at that point uh so HR, you said about uh, a point-based system, there's going to be a, a guide to balance encounters. Yeah, so what's interesting about challenge ratings, and challenge ratings as a base in 5th edition is a great way of balancing your encounter. So when you have, say, four fourth-level adventurers, then you know if I throw a four CR, four challenge rating into the mix, that that is going to be 
in under fifth edition, uh, a fair challenge. But of course, a fair challenge is not the same as 50-50. And that's one of the things we do talk about a little bit about what CRs mean. So if, if you uh, uh, challenge rating in fifth edition is that the CR number is equivalent to four adventures of that type who will have virtually guaranteed to succeed with uh, probably no casualties. It's not going to be overly difficult to do. So the default being you're going to win. And that's what a CR4 is. Uh, if you, say, took a one-player character and just by themselves a CR4 and put them against a CR4 clone of themselves, so one character versus one character, you could say that could be a 50-50. That would be a toss-up. But that is not what D&D wants you to do. I mean, fifth edition is set up that it's four adventures of that level equals your CR. So four fourth level adventures would be good, uh, a fair balance against one CR4 monster. But they're, they're going to defeat it because a one-on-one -on -one clone would be vastly overpowered for that. And overpowered means it's a toss-up. There's a good chance that the player character might die. So we took that element and said, well, if we're going to be using points in Anime 5e, what are the elements that we're going to look at and break it down from there? And so because we use a point-based structure of all the different creatures and monsters, as well as the player characters have them as well, but the PCs have levels, and that's one of the big differences. So if I'm a, a fifth-level class, uh, even if I'm multi-class or I'm single-class, if I'm fifth-level, that kind of defines where I'm going to be in my power range. But like, what, what's an orc or an ogre? I mean, you can go with a CR, but how are they going to be built? And that in anime 5 es from a point-based system. So we break down the different challenge ratings according to points, and then we provide guidance of saying, well, yes, if you are a bunch of 10th level characters, then if you fight one 10th level CR, that is going to be, you're, you're going to win, and you're probably going to, to win handily, and you're probably not gonna have any um, uh, casualties in your group as well. But one of the things that we approach with CRs is that it's not just about fighting. One-on-one uh, -on -one in the dungeon. So a classic example, if you were to, to be in a dungeon, open up a door, and there is a succubus in that room, there's a really good chance, based on the succubus of CR, that, that they are weaker than their total package of abilities are. But Anime 5D, 5e does not assume that the default is going to be a, a combat game. So it's certainly a big part of 5th edition. But there are so many things that, say, succubi can do that is not related to direct one-on-one -on -one combat and this is a lot of things with subterfuge a lot of uh, aspects that aren't as combat oriented but are still represent what an entire challenge would be and our challenge ratings are based on the total difficulty of a creature the total challenge of a creature not just the combat challenge of the creature and so while a lot of our all uh, CRs align with they might be in the Monster Manual 5th edition, not all of them do. The, the creatures that have a lot of diverse abilities that aren't related to combat, maybe they have social uh, things. So if you were to encounter a, let's just say a mob boss of uh, a succubi, and they're going to be involved in say the the local guild or they're going to be causing havoc outside of a dungeon they're going to be a lot tougher than if you just open up a dungeon door and you fight them straight up so yes uh, thank you for that question we do actually have something that is going to be looking at a balancing of how to do it crs are a great base and then we just expand a little bit further uh, into the assumption of non-combat plus combat uh, just quickly scrolling through uh, a couple of the uh, texts here. So, Emmanuel, you mentioned about wondering if there's going to be community support and events around Anime 5e. Um, yeah, so certainly we're, we're a small company. There's no doubt. When we partnered with Japanime Games to do Best and Fourth Edition, it was a great partnership because they have, they're have they a larger company than we are. They attend a lot of conferences and conventions, and they did, obviously, a lot of games based on Japanese anime. So it made sense for us to partner with a larger company. We're not going to be able to keep up with the um, the Paizos and the, and the Wizards of the Coast by having tons of events and organized play. We're, we're just, that's not, not who we are. We are a much smaller company than that. We do plan to have support, certainly Enemy 5e, and, and how what form that's going to take is is going to be something that we're going to be formulating over the next little while because when we when we launched the Kickstarter, we didn't know how well it was going to do. It could have been 
a moderate success. Uh, maybe we reached our 10,000 goal of funding and that's enough to, to do a moderate print run. And hey, we, did, we produced a great game and we got it into the, the fans' hands that wanted it. And we could be happy with that, no problem. But of course, it's, it's vastly exceeded expectations and we had no clue it was gonna do nearly as well as it did. So that clearly indicates that, yeah, we, we need to put some, some resourcing towards expanding the, the 5e line. And that does include uh, support of a sort, uh, but, Unlike when we did with Bassem 4th edition, where really there is not a lot of external support for that. Um, certainly the there was a great fan discord that's been done for Tristat. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing community, amazing place with there. But other than that, kind of everything's for Bassem 4th edition has been on us. With anime 5e, yes, the anime 5e specific aspect is definitely something that's unique to us. But fifth edition i mean D D. there's so many resources out there and so many forums and uh, adventure i mean the adventures yes they're not anime 5e adventures they're general adventures but the amount of content and resources and community for fourth edition or fifth edition in general is massive and so we're not going to be able to duplicate that no it nor would it really make sense for us to do so but we do plan to have something uh we do plan to provide some of that community support, whether it's, you know, easy access to us or uh, maybe set up some sort of dedicated forum. Obviously, on Facebook here, having a, a group is certainly great, but we're, we're kind of overwhelmed with the success with the Kickstarter, and so we're going to be formulating a lot of plans as we go. Um, gee, I'm trying to keep up with these comments, and it doesn't look like it's kind of coming in, in in order. It's a little bizarre, but I'll try to do the best I can to, to get through these. So Chris mentioned how many, how much of the stretch gold were, were planned? Well, uh, we certainly had some stretch gold plans, but we didn't know how many we needed. So one, one of the things as a creative, what I never want to do is go into any project like this with massive expectations because I, I don't want to be disappointed, of course. You have to set up your plan. You have to say, well, this is what I need for funding, and this is where I think it might go, and here are some of the things we might do with stretch goals. I mean, this isn't our first Kickstarter. Uh, we've done several more of RPG-type stuff, and so we had some ideas. But then once things start coming out and they start producing and the numbers going up and up and realizing, oh, well, we're we're kind of running out of stretch goals and maybe this wasn't something that we were really prepared for. So going into the community and saying, hey, what do you want? And some of it is directly, like there, there might be a comment that I say, oh, that's a great stretch goal by itself. Or it could be something that's that sparks some thought or a different way of thinking. It's like, oh, well, that stretch goal doesn't work, but that got me thinking of doing something else. Uh, so yeah, it's it's great to have the community given those suggestions. Of course, you know what what gamers they want as much as they can get and, and as cheaply they can get, and I totally understand that. Um, but with the stretch goals, the philosophy we we posted an update on it, but it's really important that we do not delay the core book. I mean, I don't know how many of you back Kickstarters regularly, but I normally see RPG Kickstarters that are you know a year passes and they're not delivered yet, and we absolutely did not want that. I don't want the the game, the books that are written and they have to be you know final final passes and a few more eyes on it i don't want that being delayed past when it needs to be and so the idea of oh it's like oh we can add all this extra art and we can expand the, the book by 16 or 32 pages and add all this extra content well doing that is just going to mean the book's going to be delayed and that's not something that i think anyone wants to see so one of the advantages when we're doing the stretch goals is we have to make them not too expensive because what's the value of, of having stretch goals if, if all the funds are putting towards that? Uh, they can't take a lot of time because we don't want the product delayed. Uh, and they have to be something that is offered a, a, across the wide spectrum. So we do have a lot of stretch goals that are offered for the minimal uh, pledge of $13. But then we have some stretch goals which push the envelope a little higher and are only available at upper level tiers. And the reason why we do that is is twofold. One, to, of course, to reward people who who give us a lot of support. And we want to say, you know, thank you for for not even just getting the core book, but you got in and, and you got the GM screen, uh, the game screen, and you got the character folio, and you got the pocket edition, and you re really went big. And so we want to give them something as thanks as well. And then, of course, there's also the uh, the built-in idea that if someone is, maybe they, they have a certain pledge, and they could go higher, but, you know, they're not really sure. And then they can see that there's some 
some value given that if they up their pledge to that next tier, they can qualify for some different rewards. It, it helps us because it gets us more resourcing that we can then produce more in the, the line uh, and you know get better art or more art, uh, hire some additional writers and expand the product offerings. So we, our goal is to offer stretch goals across the continuum and not just focus on one particular area. And I, th I think so far that it's been a good balance for that. Uh, let's see. Aaron, so what would you say the biggest anime influences while writing the book? Uh, well, that's interesting, of course, because my biggest anime influence, no doubt, is Ranma, uh, one half. I mean, that's, but that, that's not fantasy. Um, so when, when I'm thinking about the anime influences of the game, it, it really is a combination of all the anime that, uh, you know, have consumed and had to consume a massive amount of anime. anime. So Record of Lotus War obviously is a great anime series, but it's, it's really just Dungeons and Dragons. So in some ways you can, anime 5e is Record of Lotus War the way it exists. Uh, but certainly some of the the more modern ones uh, had an effect in it. Um, and even, not even just anime uh, straight up, but certainly manga um, and gaming, let's say, lit RPGs as well in terms of what you need regarding, say, you need debuffs or you need to have things that represent uh, you, things that expand fantasy beyond the traditional token as high fantasy. So, uh, for example, you have, you can have high fantasy, low fantasy, steampunk fantasy. You can have urban fantasy, uh, romantic fantasy. And so we draw in from a lot of different anime sources. I mean, Demon Slayer has, has been something, something that I think is great. Uh, Sword Art Online has been great. Black Clover. I mean, a lot of the, the classics. But then you also look at something that's not fantasy and, and something like uh, My Hero Academia, that there might have some abilities or powers that are completely appropriate to bring into an a fantasy setting they just happen to be expressing it in a different way in that particular anime so it's really a kind of a, a complex combination but also you know, a lot of throwbacks to 80s and 90s anime sailor moon as an example i got sailor moon shirt um so sailor moon is was although it takes place in the modern day those characters would fit really really well in a fantasy setting as well magical girls are one of the uh, classes that we have uh, in it. And so obviously it's going to take a, a slightly different form than if it's a modern day. But the idea of, of someone that changes form and has an alternate identity and they they have that duality certainly plays out really well. It's it's maybe not as dungeon crawly, but that's not what Anime 5e is. It's designed to be a little bit broader than, than just a dungeon crawl. Uh, just looking at the comments. Um, Aaron, you mentioned... Uh, about, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Tactical Combat Simulator. Yeah, f people love or hate 4th Edition. Uh, honestly, I know very little about 4th Edition. That just wasn't in my headspace. And, you know, hear hearing so many things online about 4th Edition that it really wasn't what I think a lot of role players were looking for. Maybe maybe gamers were looking for, but maybe not role players. And, and I certainly am more of a, a narrativist role player, and that's how I want to design my games. It's not that I don't want to give, of course, fans what they're looking for, but I think presenting a more narrative approach to role playing is just uh, it's a slightly different perspective. So yeah, fourth edition, uh, I'm, gl I'm glad we're on fifth. Let's just put it that way. Um, let's see. So Michael indicates that uh, you, are, you, you, you still play Best of D20, which is pretty awesome. Um, and we're looking at, is there any expansion beyond just fantasy? That's certainly a possibility. I mean, when we did Bessem 4th Edition, I mean, Bessem is a multi-genre universal RPG, so it covers the entire range. I mean, if you can think of it, you can play it, whether it's, you know, superheroes, horror, fantasy, sci-fi, hard SF, soft SF. Yeah, we, we cover the range of that. But of course, with Bessem D20, it kind of tried to be everything, which didn't make any sense to try to make a third edition game. But what we tried to do is kind of sh take Bessem and shoehorn it into third edition. And while we succeeded in some aspects, I think there's other aspects we failed on by not having that focus. So with fifth edition, uh, for anime 5e, we could focus a lot more on the fantasy. So in the future, would it make sense to expand out? Yeah, we, we certainly could do that. But there's a reason why 5th edition, or let's say Dungeons and Dragons, is more popular than any science fiction RPG or horror RPG. Um, 
it is people like their fantasy. I mean, fantasy was you can say it's the first, and it's enduring. Uh, people love the fantasy. Even if you look at the amount of of say isekai anime out there, a lot of it is fantasy. There's not a lot of say sci-fi um, ones with that. And some of the biggest shows have those fantastical, fantastic elements. Um, biggest anime movie of all time is Demon Slayer, and that's not too long ago. But that's not to say that we're going to be sticking with a, just a particular type of fantasy, like a high fantasy. So there's lots of room within the realm of fantasy. There's a lot of flexibility there. Um, so Daniel, you're, you're mentioning about how, you know, you had the original Bessem Dungeon book, and that was something that we did for Bessem Second Edition, and wondering if we could end up porting it to Anime 5e. So Bessem Dungeon was um, a bit of a, it, was, it certainly had a dungeon crawling aspect, so it also presented a lot of uh, fantasy creatures. And of course, there are, if, if, if you want to find creatures for a fifth edition game, there are so many monster manual style books out there. Now, they're not all Anime 5e, but the great thing about Anime 5e is you could bring any fifth edition creature and just port them directly in to... Uh, anime 5e and then we set that up on purpose now maybe the the crs won't match up as i discussed a little bit earlier that they might be off slightly but the amount of characters that you'd have uh, access to because it's fifth edition and it's so widely available through the open gaming license so there's so many creatures available out there and there's no sense in us just duplicating all of it but there's a, you know a dungeon crawl is certainly a lot of fun and um at this point i'm not going to take anything off the table because we don't necessarily know the direction we're going to be taking with it so uh it's certainly possible uh andrew you asked about can you get a playable demon race um, so demons, you mentioned specifically, you know, seven deadly sins, uh, or yeah, seven deadly sins. We're not going to have particular expressions about a particular show. So we have a slime a race in anime 5e, but it is not Rimuru from that time I got reincarnated by slime. We have two different demonic style races. We have the archfiends and we have the demonaga, but they are not particularly from a specific anime show. So they are demons. And what what is a, a demon? When we're bringing in a, an effects-based system, a, a demon doesn't mean anything. If it's just a collection of attributes and defects, like a, abilities, think about those features. So could a, take, take the standard D&D elf. I mean, you could say it's a demon elf and have a, all the exact same things, but it's a demon elf. You could easily do that. And so, yes, uh, absolutely, anime 5e can handle demons. We have two demon-style races, but we're not going to have specific expressions related to a particular show that you're familiar with. Because, first of all, we don't have the license for those shows, but also it's um, we wanted to create something a little bit more universal. Uh, so, Milo, you asked about uh, the most challenging aspect of Anime 5e's development process. Yeah, that, that's a really great question. And I'd probably say it was, it was the, the balancing that we had to go so every point every feature in a game is going to be tied to something else for example if i say okay i want to have some sort of attribute that is armor class so your armor class goes up by one so maybe this is like rock armor so not not putting on a leather jerkin or a suit of chainmail but my skin for my particular race is going to be their their armor is tougher so i have to look and say well how does that balance against everything else in fifth edition that affects that for example um dexterity if you up your dex by two not one but two then you get an armor class boost by one in some instances depends on the type of armor you're wearing if you have heavy armor then it caps out at say a plus two advantage of dexterity so it's taking the, the books and just deconstructing them down and and once you you do that you start creating spreadsheets of abilities and powers and how does a balance against b and sometimes you may get a balancing where you think well these two things don't balance but um, in terms of the raw power but the utility changes that balancing structure so if i have a really powerful ability maybe you'd think well that's that's worth effectively a lot of points because it's really powerful but what if i could only do it once a day 
um, or between short rests or long rests. And so we have to bring in multipliers of to say, well, this is a, a really powerful ability, but it's very rare. You can't use it all the time. So bring in a, a point ha a half modifier or a 0.25 modifier and then balancing everything out with that. So we had to go through all the races, all of the features of every class uh, and then start looking at how do you break all these downs and balance them against each other and then layer on top of there is the comparison of the attribute system that we use which is the point based uh, purchasing aspect so a traditional say a fighter or wizard class you go up in level you go up one level and they say you get x here's your ability here's your feature that you get when you go up a, a level and maybe there's a small selection that here's your feature you get to choose a b or c of the, the this particular feature but with anime 5e there's a lot more features that we have access to and while yes we do say sometimes when a when a particular class goes from level five to level six we might say well here's what you get specifically but then we might also say well here's two points you get to spend and you get to spend those two points on anything you want or it could be some some of the attributes we have are uh, almost like container style attributes so we have something called combat technique and there will be 10 different combat techniques, which you know, could be looked at as maybe like a martial archetype or, or something like that. But it's they're, they're small and they're contained, but they are, you would get combat technique. And so you go from level 5 to level 6 in this particular class, the write-up might be you get one combat technique. But now you choose one of 10 different things that you can focus on. So definitely the, the point balancing is the most difficult. What's well, actually one of the things I enjoy the most about game design are these um, just really getting into the to the numerical system. I mean, my background, although I've been doing game design and, and I've been a politician for the past six years, city council, my background in, in my, I guess my life in many ways has been, I'm a scientist, uh, did uh, synthetic organic chemistry for eight years at university. I mean, that's where my, that, that number crunching is where I really enjoy it, which is interesting because when it comes to role playing, I'm much more narrativist and story driven and the, the points and the character sheets aren't nearly as important as the, the role itself. But when it comes to design, uh, I think being that number cruncher is what I really enjoy. So, uh, yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Uh, many will ask about if there's going to be a conversion guide. Uh, so, we don't have a conversion guide between Bessem and or Tristat and 5th edition. And the reason why, first of all, you'll see there'll be overlap in names. So you'll be able to line up as like, well, flight in 5th edition or flight in anime 5, or sorry, flight in Bessem 4th edition or flight in anime 5e. They're both flight. They're going to have some similarities with that. But also it's just a fundamentally different system. Yeah, I'll probably come up with some sort of... Uh, um, document at some point like body mind and soul are the three stats in Bessem. well how does body mind and soul align with the six ability scores in Dungeons of the dragons and there's not a, a perfect match but we'll probably come up with something with that but i would say there's not going to be an easy path of conversion it could be more of a recreation so you can take a look at say the stats of an orc or a white dragon or whatever and you can look at the entire anime 5e stat base for that and you can then do another version basically a, a transliteration of it into best and fourth edition or vice versa but to do uh, like a mathematical conversion would be, be very difficult to actually have a straight up conversion um uh thanks uh daniel i mentioned about slayers d20 yeah thank that was that was a lot of fun back when we were doing that when we had licenses and we did a tri-stat version we did a d20 version um and yeah so that was that was fun back then slayers was, was a great show certainly I definitely played into it. If you uh, look at what Lena Inverse can do, I mean, she's off the scale in some aspects, and then she's very much uh, like almost like a teenage girl in in other aspects. And so that power level, that power dynamic, is would make a great setting for a fifth edition game. Uh, Chris, you had talked about uh, Anime Week in Atlanta, and love to get. Uh, you know, to offer some sessions end of October. So yeah, we're, what we're looking for right now, and so it plays out well, if everything goes well, then May, we're gonna be able to send the PDFs out to all the backers. So if you have your convention at, uh, in October, uh, then yeah, there wouldn't be a problem. Not that maybe October, you know, conventions overall in 2021 might be a little bit dicey but uh, certainly by the time october rolls around we expect the pds to be done by then and if you know there's no shipping delays and if everything goes well we should have the, the print edition uh, at that time as well 
uh, dice junkies. You mentioned about a retailer tier. Um, yeah, so w- the way we do retailers is a little different because uh, you know, I used to be a retailer. Uh, we ran a, a board game cafe. And what I what I didn't like as a retailer is when a publisher tries to tell you what you should be carrying and in what quantities. So we have a different type of tier for retailers in Anime 5e where you pledge $2 and that's all you pledge in the Kickstarter, which is really, it's, it's not $1 because $1 is often the followers, but $2 is, is a signal to us that, hey, you're a retailer. And then we'll reach out to uh, all everyone that, that pledges the $2 during the Kickstarter and reach out afterwards. And we have a wholesale program that it, at that point we say, well, what do you want from the Kickstarter? And we'll provide you as much as you want in any quantities you want um, in the the different uh, amounts that you want so we're not going to say well you should have this many core books and this many character folios and this many game screens you can determine if you don't want any game screens or you want one game screen and and 10 of the core books great then you can just order that and we can make sure you get everything as a retailer you'll get everything with the rest of the backers during the kickstarter plus the stretch goals and this is something we find is a better way of doing with retailers what we do after the kickstarter is over that's when we we get more specific in terms of what the pledges are rather than offering a, a, a retailer tier at uh, you know a 600 diet dollar buy-in and we're going to send you this many core books and this many expansions no that's not how we do it so uh if uh you, you know any retailers out there that might be interested back it for two dollars it doesn't tie up their dollars doesn't top your inventory and it's another thing of course is as a retailer do i want to back a kickstarter and then have my my inventory dollars tied up for who knows how long until it's actually funded all we're tying up is two dollars and then we collect the rest before shipping so we, we think it's a it's a really good way to doing that program and so far i think that the retailers have liked it that we've worked with with the previous ones uh william uh, you asked about how easy it is to take anime 5e adventures and you with anime or D and D adventures using them with Anime Five E, and that's the great thing. You can just pick up a, a a module as is and run it, and you can bring in Anime Five E classes into it, um, or you can bring in some of the elements that we have in Anime Five E into any of the existing Fifth Edition mo- uh, modules. Now, a couple of things we will say. Uh, for example, we have some races that can fly. I mean, not not spells. They actually have wings. The Azrai have wings, and so if this uh, adventure and maybe it's a dungeon crawl and set up as the difficulty in crossing a pit well if you happen to chose a race that can fly they're just going to fly over and it's not an issue so yeah it's because our our offerings are much more expansive and are are more uh let's just say taken to to power 11 not that they're more powerful but in terms of the the, the gonzo anime aspect is a little bit higher. There may be some elements that you're going to have to look and go, oh, does, does this really make sense uh, if this character is doesn't really fit into the adventure? And then that comes down to just making sure that you have the right character choices. So if a game is, is being set where it's going to be difficult to have challenges if a character can fly then maybe that's not the the right uh either trap or dungeon or adventure for that particular game but in terms of the mechanic wise absolutely i mean we want we wanted all or just about all the fifth edition existing material to be able to use with anime 5e because it is fifth edition i mean that's the important thing we yes we we reimagine it but a lot of it's going to be coming down to the races and the character class progression so we provide all the rules if you're going to be uh, a warder that's one of the races that we are the classes that we have and we provide the 20 different levels of progress for the warder you can then use that in any fifth edition um, expansion material the balancing aspect we address that we do talk about how to balance different um, classes from fifth edition versus what we're doing and we try to balancing everything numerically and you know we we will say well we think a wizard is more powerful than a rogue in general and so if you want to power up your rogue to be balanced with the wizard you're going to throw some extra points to them so, some uh, some extra freebies and by doing that we think that that will balance the classes a lot better so yeah we wanted to make sure that there was a lot of compatibility so great great question um just reading through um so manuel asked about uh supports or regulations oh yeah uh oh yeah the dm's guild uh, allowing to use community content so this gets into kind of open gaming license stuff we have uh this is published under open gaming and so a lot of the material is going to be open and if people want to do their own thing with it afterwards uh whether it's published on drive-thru or or 
print publications or whatnot. Yeah, we, we certainly saw that when we did um, we did Mecca D20 and Bessem D20 uh, back in Guardians of Order days, and DreamPod Nine did a Mecca D20 companion. And it's funny actually that the companion came out before Mecca D20, which is a little bizarre. We had a delay in the printer, um, but we had sent them the files in advance because we knew we, they wanted to do something D20. So that was uh, an instance where, because of the, the openness of uh, an open gaming system, other people are, are free to, to play in the sandbox that kind of we're creating because we're playing in Dungeons and Dragons sandbox, certainly. All right. Um, Vinny. Oh, yeah, stretch goal to unlock a live stream in an adventure. Um, at some point, don't know when it is, there's a lot going on, but uh, yeah, I'm going to run um, a game online and g grab a group of my uh, either gaming friends or, or industry friends uh, and just run through something, which will kind of just showcase some of the aspects of Anime 5e. You know, a lot of people are just going to watch it if, and they're going to say, well, it just seems like a Dungeons and Dragons game. And it's true. It, it, they are using the same system, but some of the the nuances of it. That's we we certainly intend to to highlight that. Uh, yeah. So okay, that's good. Um, HR. I mentioned about how Anime Five E tackles the large size templates, and uh, let's drop my water. <laughs> and yeah, the. The different sizes, that's probably what I would say the biggest change between 5th edition and Anime 5e is how we address sizes. And part of that that goes with the, the philosophy that I had when I designed Best in 4th edition, but also, I mean, it goes back well beyond, beyond that. And this is what it really comes down to is there's a massive difference. When you go from someone who's 6 feet tall to being 12 feet tall, there's not a small change in that. There is incredibly massive. When you consider size, uh, we're, we're volume. So we have a height and we have a width and we have a depth to us. And uh, if someone was to go double in height, well, you're doubling the width and the, the, the length and the depth. And so that's actually an eight times multiplier. Uh, you could say roughly 10 times, but eight times multiplier is what you're looking at whenever you're increasing in height. And so what is the power? If you if you took someone who's 12, an ogre, as an example, 10 foot tall uh, as an ogre, and you'd look and say, well, if I scaled my human up to ogre size, um, they're going to be really powerful and you know, super strong. Uh, the Just the amount of strength you need to carry around that much mass is is going to be uh, massive. And, and then you also have things like, well, if my skin is going to be thicker, I'm going to be tougher and I'm going to be able to resist damage to, to certain aspects. And then you get all the hit modifiers. And this is something that, that I think works really well. And, and as a game designer, I, I always geek out about it. It's something that I, I came up with as a concept a long time ago, back you know, 15 years ago, about size modifiers, where if you have a medium and a medium, the, the base game is you, know, you have your armor class and you have your d20 hit roll and they're going to be rolling compared to the armor class and a medium versus medium is a certain level well if both of those characters are suddenly to grow to gargantuan the effect should be the exact same a gargantuan versus gargantuan should play out identically to a medium versus medium and that means that every advantage i get for one character for being big should be offset by the disadvantage that the opponent gets and that balance is so important. So if you were to play a game where, well, let's play a, a fifth edition game where everyone's going to be a fairy and we're going to play small. And uh, maybe like you're running a Borowers uh, or uh, you know, something where everyone's a pixie or fairy or converse. You're running a stone giant game. Everyone's a stone giant. And that's the, the campaign that you're playing at. Well, you don't have to worry about all of the modifiers and how they're going to balance out because they balance against each other and they're going to play out the exact same way you would as if you're two medium characters. And that core element does not exist in current fifth edition. So if you were to look at, at a human and a human can pick up a certain amount of weight and a human can move a certain distance, if you suddenly took this human and scaled them up in gargantuan, they become incredibly weak and slow, so slow uh, compared to their size. And I think that that really didn't play out well with, with, with what I was driving. I mean, even if you just look at, I think, halflings. So halflings are small. So you're looking at someone three feet tall versus a six foot tall human. 
So, I mean, I, I had kids. I know, you know, when my kids were three feet tall, if I was moving 30 feet around, they're not moving 25 feet around. I mean, they would, their little feet would have to be just going like crazy to keep up with me. So again, uh, roughly half the size, they're going to move at half the speed because their legs are half as long. And so their, their strides are going to be half as long as well. And so this is an important aspect. It's going to be foreign to hardcore fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons players. These sizes aren't going to make any sense. But when you look at them, when you break them down, and we try to explain it as well as we can, that there is an inherent consistency, rationality, logic that is applied to this so that you're not going to have a human who maybe grows up to be someone super tall and suddenly can't lift his sword because the, the strength just doesn't scale appropriately and the mass that they can lift doesn't scale. And, and the reverse is, is true as well, is we don't want to, to get in a situation where someone who's going to be small proportionally is super strong compared to a human size. So it's a great question. Anyone familiar with, with our work in best and fourth edition certainly knows kind of the approach we took with it. And we bring that into anime 5e as well. And I think it's, it's one of the, the most elegant uh, game designs that I've that I've done in a while. It's particular sizes. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. Uh, just scrolling a little bit here. Uh, oh yeah. Um, just filling in a little bit. Chris talking about uh, AWA planning and safety protocols. Yeah, it's going to be uh, conventions for a while are, are going to be a little dicey. Uh, so you know, not that. You know, Discami does a lot of conventions, but we we've written off 2021 for conventions. Um, you know, not only are we Canadian, and, we, and right now the borders are closed, so we don't know when we can travel. But also, we because we don't have domestic production of vaccines, Canada is behind where the states is in terms of vaccinations. And then then finally, it's just you know, does does it make sense this year? Um, no. So we're not going to go to Gen Con or Origins or any other conventions that pop up. This is not the year for conventions for that. So we'll just push it off and we'll look at 2022 for conventions. Um, so we didn't do any in 2020. The last one was the uh, Gamma Expo in, in March of 2020. And it was right after that that everything kind of uh, fell apart for us. And we just didn't do any conventions last year. The ones, the few that we go to, we're not going to be doing this year, even if they move the dates or whatnot. So uh, if everything goes well, as we think it will, with the uh, the transition from COVID being a, a pandemic to just a, a long term, it's another flu. It's a, just another thing you have to deal with and get shots on an annual basis. If it turns into that, then yeah, 2022 is when we're looking at coming back. Uh, Emmanuel, you asked about a non-system question. Is uh, how's the landscape for chasing licenses um, compared to a long time ago? So interestingly, that, that's actually a fascinating question. Uh, so back when we were, when I was in Guardians Border, and we did a lot of licensing back then of shows, there was a lot of what I would call uh, maybe license consolidators that had control of the licenses. So for example, uh, Deke had Sailor Moon and several others. You had AD Vision. Uh, AD Vision was a big publisher, Pioneer Entertainment, and Pioneer had such a, a wide catalog, we'd only have to deal with Pioneer, which was not, there often weren't even the, the Japanese arm. Pioneer is a Japanese company, but Pioneer US was not involved with a lot of the licenses that they had. And so we would go to an English-based company in the US, AD Vision, Pioneer, Anoki Films, which did uh, Slayers, for example, and Utna. And so we would go to the consolidators to acquire the licenses and all the approvals would go to the consolidators. Well, you flip over now and there's a lot more almost di working directly with the Japanese company or the the American arm of the Japanese company, for example. And we got uh, previously, when we had the Sailor Moon license, uh, you know, a couple decades ago, we were dealing with Deke, um, who had an agreement to do the English version and they licensed it from Toei and Kodansha. Well, now with our Sailor Moon Crystal license, we go directly with Toei. And it is the, the U.S. arm of Toei, but it's still Toei. And so we're dealing with effectively Japanese companies um, or their U.S. offices. And that's a very different situation because the approval processes are completely different. We've had one game with uh, for Salem and Crystal, certainly an anomaly for us, 20 months in approval for a game. And uh, it's at the factory right now, so we're getting some pre-production stuff up. It's Salem Moon Crystal Imposterous. It's a party game based on Hive Mind uh, that's published by Clyby Games. It's a Richard Garfield game. And it's, it's a really fun uh, party game that we're going to have for Salem and Crystal. But it was dealing with the 
almost the, the source companies. And so, yes, there are definitely still some, you know, Funimation, as an example, as a company that, you know, has a lot uh, of, of things underneath their belt. But we're finding that there's a maybe it's a lot closer tied to the original Japanese source than it was previously, which has its own challenges, certainly, because if you are if you're the creators, if you're dealing with someone that a lot closer to the source, it's probably going to be a little bit more dicey on the approval processes and on the attention to detail. When we were dealing with, with Deke, for example, for the Sailor Moon license, it was so easy to get things approved when we sent them off. Uh, it's like, oh, here's our Sailor Moon button in. Uh, you know, here's our design. Can we get it approved? And we'd hear back in a couple of days uh, because they didn't have that you know, to them, it wasn't their baby. They were a sub license uh, from the Japanese company. And yeah, yeah, I kind of miss those days because it was a little easier to, to get approvals on stuff like that. Pioneer was, we had some great people that we worked with a Pioneer to get um, El Hazard and Tenchi Muyo. That would probably have been a lot more difficult if we were dealing with the, the source Japanese company. Uh, so Aaron, you asked me about... Um, uh, Titan still catch knowing humans. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay. Yes, the uh, so the modifiers are going to be big uh, whenever we're dealing with size. This is just referring to you know when you're attack on Titan. If you're a Titan size, um, th they don't have all the advantages. And in fact, it's it's actually the reverse. Large characters get a disadvantage to hit people and hit things. And that the, the, the example we use in the book is if you were to stand on a field and then fire an arrow, and you're firing an arrow at a penny at a person and at a barn what are you going to most likely hit and it's going to be far easier to hit something that's bigger i mean it's a the classic instance of trying to hit something really small and that's going to be more difficult i don't know if you remember back in say second edition ad and d dwarves got this fighting bonus against giants because they were you know yes they, they understood how to fight the giants but it's also because they were they were small they can slide between their legs and that um ability comes forward that yes when you are big and you're attacking something small you have a penalty to hit but when you do hit you get extra damage you're going to be delivering and so that's kind of the, the trade-off so in in our game as example um dragons have a much lower armor class than they do in standard fifth edition dragons are easier to hit why because well, if a dragon is 30 40 50 feet long it's going to be really easy to hit it with a sword um but if you hit it, you're not going to do as much damage as you would otherwise because they're going to have a built-in uh, resistance to damage because of their size. Um, so, yeah, it certainly plays out. We, we see it in, it certainly, it makes sense rationally, but it also makes sense from uh, uh, watching different shows and how that plays out. That, yeah, it's not, it's not difficult to, to attack a Titan and hit a Titan whenever you are uh, you know, on, on the team. But doing significant damage, unless you can go for the neck, um, is is going to be a little more difficult to do. Chris, you asked about how exciting or overwhelming has the Kickstarter progress been? Um, yeah, I, a numb is a good way to describe how we're feeling. Um, it. Yeah, it's real. We see the numbers and it's it's well gone beyond any expectations that I could have possibly have had. I mean, there was the, well, we need this much. And then it's like, oh, it'd be kind of nice to get here. I can dream of that. And the funding's gone significantly above that to the point where, where it is a bit numb. And it just seems like, wow, why why are so many people interested in this? You know, is is it is this really what they're looking for? And it's it's an odd feeling, but it's also it's it's disruptive in many ways. Not not in a not in a bad way. It's just I have to rethink what the company is going to be doing, how we're going to be approaching stuff. Um, it, when you have something that has clearly captured the attention of a lot of people, then we want to make sure that we we get we deliver and we produce the best product possible. And we're super happy with what we have, but we know there's going to be you know that that follow up product and so we're we're taking a couple steps to to expand our company offerings and we have a you know a couple things we'll be announcing of, as time goes on that we're we're pretty happy with but um excited and elated but but a lot of numbness as well just like it's almost difficult to believe that it's being so successful and uh it's it's really it's really humbling uh, you have any, ask if, uh, Manuel, if there's any fun stories from prototyping, um, and, uh, you know, forming anime 5e. Uh, that's a good question. 
I think some of the, the the sample combats played out a little bit differently than expected. Where you, you know in the early playtest stuff, you're like, oh, well, my character's gonna do this, and then it's like, oh, I just squished that person completely. That was that was wow. That was that was huge. I mean, and part of it comes from the D20 system itself, and that D20 is so swingy. So typically, in, in other games that I designed, uh, for example, best and fourth edition, we use bell curve, so two D6. Bell curves are much more predictable and are easy to kind of like, okay, well, this is the bell curve and we know that there's a really good distribution in here where you get a D20 and that swing between a one and a 20 is is massive. And in fact, it's linear and it's super swingy. So you could have characters like, oh, my 10th level character against your first level character. But in the end, uh, if one person rolls a one and one person rolls a 20, uh, that first level character might get in those lucky shots, might be able to do more than what they're, they're supposed to. Now, of course, the NMA 5e and the fifth edition system is set up that it's it's not going to be really possible to completely overwhelm something super pop, more powerful than you, uh, not with a single roll. But that single roll does allow for those those swinginess. But I mean, I certainly remember the days of playing Dungeons and Dragons where my dwarf has battle axe and, you know, I had to score that 20 uh, because it was just a really difficult thing I was fighting against and I roll the dice and I score that 20 and it's, a 20 does have more feel than a 12 on a 2d6. I got to say, there's, even if the percentage chance is less of rolling uh, a 12 on a 2d6, it's only one out of 36 versus one out of 20. But that, that roll of a 20 is, there's something magical about that. It's like the, the, the siren call to gamers is that d20 roll. But there is the game design aspect of it, you know, the, the, my game designery aspect. It's like, ah, this should be a 2D10 system, not a, not a 1D20. And a 2D10 system would produce a more predictable, standardized result. Um, but that's that's not what it is. I mean, so maybe at some point I'll, I'll play with the 2D10 and, and maybe do an article or something on it because I think there's value in, in changing that up because I, I think that bell curves are more representative of, of life. And I think it's easier to to kind of represent someone that has that built-in skill versus someone that doesn't have it. And the 2D10 system is going to be more predictable, but but that's not 5th edition. 5th edition is 1D20, and we're certainly sticking with that. So yeah, that was that was some of the fun aspects of it. And of course, at any time you're playing anime characters and doing play tests, the, the hijinks that are going to come out with that. And we, we're not intending this to be a comedy game, but there's not panty shots everywhere and people pulling extra space dimensional hammers out and slamming people down. We don't have rules for that kind of stuff because that's that's more flavor text that people would throw in. But uh, anime is a is a little more gonzo. When I'm playing D&D, I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm Aragorn or I'm Gimli. Like I'm I'm into the, the the Lord of the Rings style. That's how I like playing my D&D games is getting into that that grittier high fantasy feel. But when I'm playing anime 5e, suddenly I'm I'm someone else. I'm doing leaps in the air, 30 feet long, and slashing down with my sword. It's a very different feel uh, of when I'm playing those games. Even if the mechanics are the same, it just it evokes something a little different. Uh, would we consider fantasy anime miniatures? So, uh, thanks for the question, Aaron. So, minis. Minis are, wow. Uh, I remember the Reaper minis Kickstarter that came up, where they started, it was like, okay, you get 50 minis, and it's 100 bucks. We're like okay, well I, I I'll can I'll I'll get that. And then every day they're saying, oh, another mini and stretch goal. Throw it in, go throw it in, throw it in. And by the end, you're like, I got three or four hundred miniatures for like a hundred bucks. It was crazy. Um, and that was the first really big minis Kickstarter. Was that Reaper Bones is what they called it. Since then, there are so many minis out there, and uh, there's ones that are that are manufactured uh, as straight up minis that are through Kickstarter. And then you have all the, the ones that are in retail stores, like the D&D minis, Paizo minis. And then you have, of course, all of the 3D prints that are, you know, I don't have a 3D printer personally, but I know other people that do. And they just print their own minis, which is, you know, certainly fine. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a pewter guy, but you know, that, that shows my age on, on minis. Uh, and then, of course, board games. And board games are this cross between minis and board games. And it seems that if you want to have a, a million-dollar board game Kickstarter, make sure you just throw in some minis in there. It doesn't matter if you actually need them. But uh, minis, just there's just draw to minis. So what do we like to do? anime minis yeah absolutely we would we did minis back when um for guardians of order when we did 
Silver Age Sentinels. So we did some superhero spins for for pewter minis back then. We partnered with Reaper and we got uh, Santa Gary to do our sculpts and they were based on the Silver Age Sentinels characters. And they were great. They, they didn't sell particularly well, but they were fun. There wasn't a lot of superhero minis back then. And we kind of like, hey, these are our minis. Now there's, there's not a lot of anime minis, but it's difficult to make, like if you're looking at 30 millimeter scale, I mean, what's, what's an anime fighter versus a non-anime fighter? So a lot of the, um, say like a D and D fighter versus an anime fighter, you're not going to see a lot of difference when you get down to that scale. A lot of the times that the the Bandai type figures, so they're going to be like the either be the chibi or the super deformed, uh, and they're going to be the the pre paints. They're a little bit bulkier. They're not the thirty mil, but maybe the you know they're an inch or two tall, and they have a lot of bulk to them. I have some Sailor Moon minifigs like that, and they're pretty cool. Uh, and they make great for, for board games. They'd be great for something like that. But in terms of the, the standard minis, um, it's a really crowded market. They're really expensive to get into and manufacture in low quantities, not to say you know, Anime 5e clearly has shown maybe there's there's value in doing high qual, uh, quantities with it. But there's also so much competition, so many other companies doing that. So we've been in discussion with a few companies that do uh, minis that maybe may have some sort of partnership or something that we may set something up. Not really sure how it's going to play out. Uh, it would be fun. And part of it is, is I kind of want to do things that I want to do as well as things that are commercially viable. And so if it makes sense, then we'd have some fun doing it. So yeah. Maybe. It, certainly not off the table. Um, we, we have lots of character art and lots of great character ideas that I, it could be really fun doing that. Uh, yeah, and HR, just uh, you do reply about the 2D animes we had. Yeah, and so this is... These are the, the cardboard minis. So this is one thing that we could do easily and take advantage of the full color artwork that we have is we did basically cardboard flat minis and we'd be called animinis, um, 2D animinis for best and fourth edition. So these were punch boards that you put in your little plastic bases. And uh, that was a great way for us to, to say we're doing minis. It also allowed us to do like 100 minis for 30 bucks because they're just cardboard minis. Uh, the, I know Paizo does them with their, what are they called? I forget they're 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 not anime heroes, but they're they're little tokens that they have, uh, and we you know we think that that's a great idea, and we could do something like that. Except of course you know the the anime five E minis are not that different from say best and fourth edition minis. So we might do something but with a stretch goal. That's what we did them as printable ones. So print them at home, uh, make it up as a, as a stretch goal for certain qualified tiers, and send out the PDFs. We'll have them available for for sale on drive through afterwards. People that don't qualify uh, as a way to just have something on the board if you want to have your little uh, foldable printable minis uh, but we know a lot of people have have lots of minis as it stands but you did mention about uh battle maps and so maps are some certainly something that we could do i mean one of the the, the base concepts of fifth edition is it's a grid game. It's a, it's a map type system. When you go into a dungeon, I mean, you either have your little graph paper and you're drawing your maps, or you're going to roll out your, your big map with your, um, get you on your, your markers that you draw on it and you put your characters down. Of course, now you also have all the, the, the 3d printed terrain that you can build your dungeon maps out of as well. And that, that's great. Dead to the Dragon. I've certainly done lots of those. Anime 5e is intended to be a little bit more narrative and the focus on dungeons isn't quite as big. Um, that's not to say you couldn't do that. If you say, I want to play dungeon crawling anime 5e, absolutely, go ahead. Uh, it certainly supports it. But we also like the idea of playing a lot more. Well, you're in town and either the, the adventures you happen when you're in the villages or in a rural setting or traveling from point A to point B and doing negotiations and familial um, type conflicts. I mean, I think that's where, where role playing really stands out as opposed to just the dice rolling for combat, which is a fine activity. Hey, I love a good dungeon crawl as, as much as the next person, but I also really like the role playing of the characterizations. And so the base structure of anime 5e, it can use the grid stuff, but we're, that's not kind of the emphasis. It's not the focus, but it's there. And so the idea of doing battle maps, we, we certainly could, but we don't have, we don't have a, a default world. We present three example settings, very cursory, uh, a high level, presentation in anime 5e but we don't have a built-in we don't have a forgotten realms we don't have a dragon lance and there's no default setting and because of that we could do battle maps at some point and 
why not? I mean, if people want them, why wouldn't we give them some anime battle maps? But that goes along with, if you're going to do that, are you going to create a setting that goes along with it? And that's something we're going to have to give some consideration to. We know that, I mean, it's certainly in the publishing history I have, you have your first tier products and your first tier are going to be your, um, your player's handbooks, your, your core books, Monster Manual, DMG, uh, those are your first tier. And then you have your second tier, things that I would consider are really important and everyone's going to want to get them, but they're not the core books. Um, Bessem Extras is a great example of what I consider as a, as a second tier uh, book that's really important to have, but not everyone's going to get it. And then when you start going down further into, oh, uh, sorry, um, character folios and Game screens are also second tier products. These are ones that have a, a wide appeal. When you start getting down into adventures or game maps, NPC books, um, minor rule expansions. I mean, I don't know if you remember back again, second edition ADD, they had the complete book of fighters, complete book of dwarves, complete book of thieves. I mean, there was almost like the splat book, so the, the old white wolf splat book method for all the different clans. So when you, the further you get away from that, first tier of core books, uh, the less appeal there's going to be of a wider audience, your sales are going to be lower, but also you're going to be reaching fewer people because the more specific you get, the more you're going to excluding people that don't like that specificity. And so, yeah, we'll take, we'll take a look. Certainly. Uh, I'll ask about, have you made any sacrifices to, uh, break back in the gaming industry? Oh, another tough question. Uh, my, uh, my, my best and fourth edition people are coming out with things. I mean, they've you know heard a lot of these answers before, and so they've been around a bit. But yeah, sacrifices. Um, I, I think part of it is maybe maybe ego is probably the the biggest thing to sacrifice. And uh, for people that know the history of you know when I was in the previous company with Guardians of Order, uh, mid two thousands, it went bad and company closed. Uh, left a lot of debt, a lot of freelancers unpaid. Um, it was it was when it was a really really bad time, and so I exited the industry completely. Uh, it just it wasn't viable. We we had a company that was successful when things are going well, and when things didn't go well, uh, my blinders were kind of on. I didn't pay attention, and I really drove the company into the ground. And it was a, a very dark time for me and many other people that of course you know relied on what we were doing and, and trusted what we were doing. So because of that exited the industry for a while. It does, didn't mean that I didn't still want to design games and I still had this itch, of course, to do design. And so when I decided in 2013 that I just had to design a board game, I had this idea and I wanted to, to do a board game upon a fable. And I said, well, if I'm going to go back into the gaming industry, then I have to accept the fact that my ego is going to be hanging out there and there's going to be a lot of blowback. Um, People have long memories, and I have to be prepared for the fact that you know I'm not rushing back with with uh, you know into loving arms from everyone. I have still have a lot of industry friends and and some people who stuck with me throughout the entire time. Um, so it wasn't as if I was completely on my own. But it has to understand that if I put myself out there. Uh, and come up with a new company, whether it's board games and then later doing Bessem, that it's going to bring up a lot of old wounds and it's going to you know, have that thick skin. Now, that said, I'm a politician. I got into um, municipal politics six years ago. I'm in my sixth year now serving in Guelph. And if, if you want to have people sling stuff at you, be a politician. Um, People are can be brutal uh, about the decisions you make and what you do, and you're corrupt. You're uh, you're you're a terrible person. You don't care about anybody. You're just lining your pockets. Uh, so you get to you, you can't get into politics unless they have thick skin. And certainly that's something that I was prepared for a little bit more when I whenever I did best and fourth edition, a step back into role playing, which I knew would be a lot more confrontational than board games because I was a role-playing company before. So yeah, I knew that that was going to be uh, something to sacrifice my ego and, and make sure that I, I put that out there. I had a little bit of training with, of course, being in politics. And in the end, if, if you can be authentic to yourself and, and do the best you can and try not to wrong anyone and try to do do good rather than harm, and if you make that attempt, then then it, it should be uh, at least you're going to give it the good shot and you're going to be able to, to hold your head high. And, and I feel great about how discomi has been going. And so, yeah, it's a great question, Milo, but that, that the sacrifice without a doubt is going to be that. The second thing, and this is anyone will tell you that, that 
takes a business out of their hobby is the more something becomes a business the less it'll become a hobby um, and so whenever i play a board game now or play a role-playing game uh, for you know decades um, it's difficult to just play without looking at the game design aspect. So if I'm playing a board game, we're like, oh, this rule, I, I, I don't like that balance there. I think it could have been done this way differently. And, you know, everyone thinks they're a, a board game designer. Of course, people often play something for the first time and, and think that they know how to do it better. And, and certainly I, I do similar things, although um, maybe I understand that the game design philosophy a little bit more. And so maybe I'm a little more forgiving on stuff, but certainly there are some games where I play and this, the design aspect is just drives me crazy and I can't just enjoy it as a hobby. So certainly one of the sacrifices is I had to sacrifice my hobby to make it a business. And I experienced that before and certainly experiencing it again. Um, and just reading through some of the comments. Um, yeah, virtual tabletops. Okay, that's actually a great thing. So prior to all of this recent stuff, um, I, I never used Roll20 or Foundry or Tabletopia or anything. That's just not what I did. And then when we did Bessem, 4th edition, people were asking, hey, what about Roll20? Hey, what about Roll20? I was like, well, I don't know anything about it. So okay, clearly there's interest. We should probably come up with some sort of Roll20 support. I don't know what that's going to take. I don't understand it. I, it's, it's just something new to me, but I committed to looking into it. So since that time, started you know playing around with Roll20, playing some games on Roll20 and seeing the interface and, and how it works and you know with, with Dungeons and & Dragons and some of the things I like, some of them I don't like. So it's, it's getting a feel for, for what's there. But what it comes down to is this isn't something that I can step into and do. It, you know, it involves a completely different skill set. So we're going to have to hire some some programmers to to work. And there's multiple levels of support for these virtual tabletops. I mean, the, the base that that I was always thinking was the right way to do it was just a character sheet stuff. So um, th that is at the basic level, I would like to have a character sheet support. So people can take any kind of virtual map or any kind of token that they have, and they everyone could have a um, a character sheet that is specific to their anime 5e and then they can just play in the virtual tabletop using that but of course i know people are, are taken to the next level and they want to have modules specifically written in say roll 20 that offer all these art assets and and the entire game books are presented in this different format which honestly is is not something i've ever done um you know when to me a game book is you you write it you lay it out you print it there's a game book maybe you have a digital pdf but these uh vtt's are so much more involved and in depth and the the amount i think of uh, resources that need to go into something like that is is intense and much greater it almost gets it like you're not fully doing a computer game but what you need to invest to do a computer game right versus doing a role-playing book right completely different so uh you know I, I don't feel like one of those like like old guys who can't keep up with the new guy technology it's just not been where my headspace is it's not how i typically role play um because again as i mentioned i'm more narrativist and so uh, a lot of my stuff is much more free-flowing and, and you don't need maps it's all a description and um like what's in my mind what i see when i role play that's my that's my battle map most of the time but i know that people want these other things and so we're, we're going to look at that i am committed um through a stretch goal that we're going to be looking at getting at the very least uh some base level support uh for character sheets what we can do beyond there i, I don't know because what i don't want to do is spend all of my time and the company's time working on things that aren't role-playing games that are like a, an interface and you spend all your time doing the interface then you're going to lose the content. And I don't, I don't want to stop producing uh, game books. I don't want to stop doing that aspect because I'm focused on this alternate way of presenting how to play. So it's it's a little tricky uh, and it's so, certainly something new, but we're, we're interested in, in trying. But yeah, so many people uh, are into that and it might not be how I play, but I know other people are. So yeah, we're, we're going to look at it. Um, Chris mentioned about Thacko. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, very true. Thacko's a, a favorite of mine. That's that's a standard second edition trope, but uh, sadly, no more Thacko. 
Uh, yeah, I see that some other people are fans. Go, Jeremy. Um, and HR. Wow, everybody's talking about FACO now. Uh, so our progress on, on uh, Gabriel asked about progress on Roll20. So just uh, to, to fill it in, we're still in the research phase at this point, is I don't want to kind of hire designers to do work if I don't understand what I like and what I don't like. And that's the best way, I think, to create a better product is to, to experience it. So I'm actually playing in some came, some campaigns using Roll20. And there are some things I'm like, oh, this is really neat. And other things I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, why would I want this aspect of the game? I think it's a badly, uh, it's a bad interface. But other things like, oh, this is this is so sweet. I just click here and this happens and, and it's pretty great. So I want to make sure that I have a really good understanding. So we're in the research phase at this point it'll still be quite a while before we actually get the implementation phase but that research phase i take it very seriously and it also comes down to uh, again resources i don't want to spend too much time on one aspect where and ignoring other aspects uh ah ask a question on kickstarter about making pcs um so this is from Raven. So this is looking at, uh, is there a chapter about uh, building and leveling up those types of PCs? So the progression, although it's Anime 5e, it is a fifth edition game. So we know what progression is like in D&D. So you beat a challenge, which is either defeating a monster or defeating something else that is still challenging. You get experience points. Once you get a certain number of experience points, you have enough to level up. And when you go up in your next level, you get so many hit points, uh, an extra hit die, and you get features associated with that level. And that's leveling up. That's advancement in D&D. And so we don't, we don't really mess with that. We wanted to make sure that it was still very similar to that. The specifics of the leveling up might change a little bit in terms of, because we are with a, a point-based balance system, it's a little different perhaps than, than D&D. But what we don't do is be specific to what might be in other anime shows. Like if you're Dragon Ball, which maybe isn't strictly fantasy, but if you're powering up in Dragon Ball or Sailor Moon, how you power up in Sailor Moon, uh, they don't say like have 20 levels in, in Sailor Moon or Dragon Ball. They may only have very few uh, progression. And so when they power up, it's a massive power up. And that's not a fifth edition um, infrastructure. So we, we are really focused on those micro implementations. I'm first level, then I go to second level, then I go to third level. And when you're first level, uh, I mean, why you, you just slay what three or four orcs and boom, I have enough experience on the next level. It's, it's not quite like that, but um, the early level progression is much more difficult than higher level progression and that's that's built into the base so uh, raven all of those shows you mentioned whether it's uh, hunter hunter or seven lovely sins dragon ball z we don't specifically talk about that yes we talk about advancement but that specific implementation probably isn't um expressed through fifth edition very well Oh, pawns. Yes, thank you, Raven. The, the the Pathfinder minis that I was talking about. I forgot what they're called. They're called Pathfinder pawns. We call them 2D animes. They call them pawns. And they're they're a great way to get a lot of um, stand-up characters on your game board for super cheap compared to printed minis. Um, Jeremy, you say you want a monster manual? Yeah, I get that, uh, certainly. And we do plan to have more in terms of the monsters. We present a very slim selection in Anime 5e, more of a, a sampling so you can see what how you do these 14 monsters and how it's done. But once you see what we do, you can literally take the DMG and easily import them into your Anime 5e game. You can translate them into Anime 5e numbers, certainly. Um, you know, It's like, well, this ability would be uh, more like this attribute at rank 4. Um, for example. So you can do that work. Obviously, you'd prefer if we did the work. And it makes sense that we know that there is a desire for that. And so uh, monsters, really big. Everyone loves their monsters in D&D. &D. Uh, and we do plan to have more of that of some form. How that is going to exactly take, I, I don't know yet. We're still, we're still formulating that plan. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Just look, read into the comments, go back and forth. Yeah, so Jeremy mentioned about helping for free with the Roll20 interface. So a few things with that. One is we are a professional company, and while volunteers are great, if I want to hire hire someone and hold their feet to the fire, I only feel comfortable if I'm actually going to be paying people. And 
um, you know, as a as a businessman I've, in real estate and as a politician, uh, there's value in in having professionals work for stuff. Now, that's not to say volunteers can't be amazing. Absolutely, there's some some people out there who aren't professionals, but their skill set is great. Um, we don't know. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure of how we're going to find a Roll20 developer, but we're going to we're going to make an attempt when we're ready. We're going to see what we can do to actually find those Roll20 developers, and we don't mind paying for a service. I mean, part of it was a stretch goal, so there's funds that we're going to be able to set aside to get that development done. Uh, but also, we want to make sure that if we're going to be, uh, we don't want to kind of like you know, sometimes you rely on your friends to do stuff. He's like, oh, can you help me out? And then if they kind of mess up or they don't follow through, you're like, well, I'm not. You know, they're kind of volunteering their time and they're just helping out of the goodness of their heart. And I can't really hold their feet to the fire. It was like, well, in the business transaction, I have no problem with withholding someone to a contract. And so that's something that whether we work with freelancer writers or artists, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay. But we also expect the work to be delivered um, to the specification that we want. And because this is a completely new field for us, uh, it's easier for us to go to someone that's established, uh, say that they have a resume of design work and these VTDs. And doing that is going to give us some confidence because I wouldn't know. It's it's like when you're, we're going to be hiring a, a freelance writer to do something. It's far easier for us to give a writing job to someone that has a resume and that said, oh, yeah, I did these 10 different products in the gaming industry than it is to just work with someone that you've never worked with before that's brand new uh, because you don't have that, that history. Um, yeah. Uh, HR, you mentioned about um, listeners could benefit from an explanation of yeah, how Anime 5e is a standalone game that layers on D&D. Yeah, let me, let me think of how to approach this because it, it does come up and, and say some of the comments in the in the Kickstarter seems to be a little complexity of like, like we present a teaser. We say, hey, here's a little rules preview. And then someone will say, well, that's not how they do it in D&D. Uh, that doesn't balance with D&D. And, and part of it is like, well, I understand that, certainly. But this this is why this is not an expansion product for Anime 5e. And it was never intended to be an expansion product for for, for D&D or 5th edition. This is a standalone game that uses the 5th edition framework. But in the end, it's going to have rules that are different than D&D or standard 5th edition. But it's going to still be a 5th edition game as a standalone product. And so we want full integration but we want to have things that are customized. So how we approach the ready action, for example, holding your action. So uh, is different than the way it is it done in standard fifth edition. The way we do it is if I'm a fighter and I'm going first, my, my initiative is an 18. I was like, oh, well, there's a tricky dynamic spell binder over there. I think they're going to be doing something with some sort of spell. And so... Uh, I'm going to wait and hold my action until they're going to go so I can then interrupt what their plans are. So I'm on 18. I'm going to hold it until I see that that spellbinder is going to do something. And then maybe the spellbinder is going to go at 10. It's like, great. So I'm now going to interrupt what they're going to do because I was holding my action. Well, now moving forward, I've now changed my initiative from 18 to 10. So in every round going forward, I am now on a 10 initiative that's different than what's in 5th edition. And if someone doesn't like that, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't like that rule. I want to use the D&D &D rule. Hey, go ahead. Like, There's no problem with using other 5th edition type stuff. But when we present a rule, there's a reason we present it. There's a reason why our races have the abilities that they have. There's a reason why a small creature or a fine or, or like a small diminutive tiny. Yeah, that's what it is. Diminutive is or uh, fine is on the list. Um, there's a reason why when we present those, they have built-in limitations on if you're if you're going to be you know a couple inches tall, you're not going to be running at at a, at a 30 speed or a 25 speed. You're going to be so much slower because you're so much tinier. And if someone says, "Well, that's not what I want in my game," no problem, change it the way you want it. But the the standalone game that we have layers on top of a standard fifth edition, a new rule set, a new new structure, a new a new, a new way of thinking about it, a reimagining of what fifth edition can be. That's balanced that's flexible and diverse and it covers so many more options so someone who's traditionally a, a a big fighter type um think think of a barbarian 
someone who's a, a bar big barbarian who wants to have a little bit of magic. It's like, well, do they have the multi-class uh, to do that? Well, in D&D, &D, yeah, they, they kind of do. If you're a, a fighter and you want to bring in these other abilities of things that aren't part of your normal class, then multi-class is the way to do it. Well, in Anime 5e, it's not uncommon to see an anime where someone kind of specializes in one field, but they have this little thing, this, this little thing that goes outside of their normal realm. So I'm a barbarian, but I can do two spells or spell-like effects, for example. Well, we can do that in our game because we've layered on a balanced, flexible point-based system on top of standard 5th edition. That isn't going to be incredibly different. This is not wildly variant. What it is is think of, of a feature as just a different expression of a class feature or a race feature. It just is a different way of doing it. But there's a consistency to what we have. And doing it as a core book that is independent of fifth edition. You don't need any other books, but you can integrate other books. Um, we thought that was the best way to approach Anime 5e. Um, I'm hoping that that is what people are going to be happy with as well. I'm hoping that they they play Anime 5e and they think, oh, this rule about X, which is different than what they do in fifth edition. Hey, I kind of like this. And um, you know, if we can expand out people's offering, that's great. If we can present um, offerings that someone plays D and D and they're playing a D and D game or a Pathfinder game, and they want to bring in this little aspect of, oh, I really like aiming. I like how aiming works in Anime Five E. So let's import the aiming rules from Anime Five E into my other game. And if they like to do that, great. Um, in the end, our goal is to give tools to help a player express the stories that they want to tell. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping with Anime 5. That's what I wanted to get from it. Uh, a lot of discussion on MAT20 and VTTs. Uh, Emmanuel, yeah, no, no problem. Thank you for, uh, for the, the chance to, to be here. I certainly enjoy talking to people. Um, oh, got a question from Aaron about how do we balance the flexibility with making them distinct? So that's actually a great question. And one of them is through numbers. And one of them is, it's not our job to make players' creations feel unique and distinct. So a great example is when we, we encourage a session zero. So at the beginning of the game, everyone sits down, all the players sits down and say, okay, let's we're going to be playing in this type of game. It's going to be focused on... Um, political intrigue, there's going to be a little bit of dungeon crawling, we're going to be jumping between different kingdoms, that's the base of the game, great. And someone says, oh, I really, really want to play a healer type, uh, I love the support role, that's what I want to do, then if everyone else knows, well, that's their, going to be their focus, it makes sense for that player to then form the creation of their character with the classes, with the point distribution, with how they're spending their resources towards creating a character that they want to play, as opposed to to us to try to force, um, art, in some ways artificially, force these restrictions on it. Um, the old examples that go back with, you know, earlier versions of D&D &D and wizards can't wear metal armor. And that was just that was a rule. That might have been one of those Monopoly move rules that don't really exist in the rules, but everyone knows you can't be a wizard and wear metal armor. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe metal messes up the magic or maybe it was just too heavy or something happens. Well, what if you wanted to be a, a magic user who wears heavy plate metal armor? Um, but you couldn't do it back then. Well, there's no reason you can't design a character that does that in Anime 5e. We give you the tools that you can create what you want to create. And it does lead to, uh, as, as you said, Aaron, about, well, does that make something not unique anymore? A fighter in D&D, &D, uh, if a fighter can suddenly cast spells and a fighter can hide in shadows and backstab, uh, if I can, if my fighter can do everything of every class, then, then if everyone's the exact same, is anyone unique? And that's when you have to look and say, well, what makes a character unique? Is it is it the points on a sheet or is it the expression of that character itself? And we tend to emphasize the story and the narrative structure is really what makes someone unique. And yes, we do. There, there's a reason why there's not one class, that there are multiple different classes and they do express things slightly differently. But we present a system that allows players to create what they want and we give them the tools for them to to express 
their desires. That's our goal. If we can do that, then we we've, we've won and we've we've done. We've set it on our mission to do something, and it, and it's going to be accomplished. And it's different than what they do in D and D. But the going back with all of that, there is one character class called the adventurer, and the adventurer doesn't have any prescribed features at all levels. From levels 1 to 20, they have nothing prescribed. All they get is points. They have unlimited spends. But there's a price for that flexibility, and they pay a 10% flexibility tax, so to speak, in terms of the points. So what we've done is we've taken all the classes and balanced them with a 200-point structure over 20 levels. Now, it's not to say that every level is going to be 10 points, but overall, roughly 10 points a level, 20 levels, 200 points. But the adventurers are only built with 190 points. So so I guess it's a 5% tax. Um, and because they're only built with 190 points, they're not going to be as powerful mathematically on a point-based system as some of the other classes because they have unlimited restrictions. An adventurer just decides what they want to do. They get two points at level one and maybe three points at level four and they just get points at every level now yes they do have built-in points based on hit dice proficiency um, in armor proficiencies in weapons and skills and tools and all that so there are there is a baseline that the fifth edition requires a certain number of points to be spent on on those uh, foundational aspects at first level but then after there it's you choose what you want Provided it's within the framework of what, what's going to work for the game, what's going to work for the power level. So if you just keep focusing and dumping all of your points into one particular thing, flight, for example. So I put all my points from first level into a flight and I get rank one or two. And then in second level, I put all my points into that as well. Well, do you really want a third or, or second level character with rank six, seven, eight, nine, ten flight, uh, which is just insane uh, level of power. No, and we, we talk about benchmarks, about how to balance out, and these are kind of the, you know, for these types of levels between one and four, we recommend capping attributes at this level and capping ability scores at this level. And so we do provide guidance, there, there's no doubt. It, it's easy to maybe accidentally break something if there's no guidance whatsoever. But if, you know, anime is all about extremes. Um, how many shows do you watch where, where someone is, an, is just an extreme in a particular field? And that's, that's what they do. It's difficult to balance it if you're looking at, at more numerical aspects of, say, adventures and challenges and encounters. Numerically, it's difficult to balance those types of things when it comes to extremes. But from narrative-wise, oh, some of my, my favorite role-playing games is when I take um, like an amber for example they have four stats uh, psyche strength endurance warfare so often i'll just say I'm, I'm going big in strength i'm going to go 80 out of 100 points is going into strength so i'm paying playing someone who's just a big hulking bruiser in the game because i like focuses on the characters when it comes to, to that and mathematically that'd be very difficult to do in a standard D D game if you're trying to balance them against all the creatures and the monsters of a standard dungeon crawl if someone is doing 50 points of damage with everything at the swing of their sword and everyone else is doing like 10 points of damage yeah that that's going to be a challenging dungeon crawl but suddenly take that person out of the dungeon crawl and bring them into a, a political type setting in a village and they're going to be at a completely different field, which which offers excellent role playing opportunities to challenge players and their characters by putting them in uncomfortable situations, and and that is the heart of what we really like about role playing. It's not it's not the fighting, it's not the rolling dice, it's the role playing. But if people just want to have dungeon crawls and slugfest, that the system easily can handle that too. Uh, so just reading through, so Danny asked about, um, well, we do like beat uh, best in the 20 and give core classes some points. Um, yeah, yeah. So what we've done is we've taken the existing core fifth edition classes and we've balanced them. And, and according to our methodology, with the way we determine, which might be different than what someone else comes up with, but in the end, we had to make certain choices, what we thought was a balanced mathematical system. Uh, barbarians and wizards are both 200 points. Like they just, they come to 200, they balance out really well. We don't have to tailor, uh, like really mess with them. Uh but every other class needs to be having some points thrown in to bring them up over 20 levels to 200 with, you know, I think the rogue is one of the, the weaker ones where other ones like druids or, or clerics, they're pretty close to 200. So they only get a, a few points. So yeah, it, it, certainly we did it in best in D20 and that's the same approach we have now. The only way to balance out all the classes, if we don't think that they're balanced as they're, they're written in fifth edition, is to add extra points and bring everyone up to, to a certain level. And we've certainly done that again. 
Uh, Jeremy asked about subclasses. So subclasses, it's interesting. Subclasses do not exist in core fifth edition as the term subclasses. What they have are almost paths that you can choose from features like archetypes or uh, paths that, as I mentioned, that you'd, you'd have you approach level four and you get to choose one of these three directions you want to take. So you can be this type of fighter or this type of fighter or this type of fighter. But in the end, they're still fighters. They just have a specialization in a kind of a particular field. That is kind of built in to anime 5e, but not presented in the same way. So we don't present subclasses. Our 14 classes are just the classes themselves, but the paths you're going to take because there's a lot more flexibility in the point distribution. And if you get something like uh, a ninja, for example, might get combat technique. Well, now you choose which of the 10 different combat techniques you want. And maybe at, at level three, they get a combat technique and maybe they get another combat technique at level eight. Uh, and then they choose another combat technique, a different one of their choices. And so in some ways, we're, it's almost like a like a way to do these types of focus subclasses, but we don't specifically address subclasses. It's not something that we're really concerned about. Uh, it's not something we're focused on because of the flexibility and the point-based balancing of the system. Um, it's not really something that I think integrated well with, with Anime 5e, so we didn't worry about that. Uh, HR, you asked about with the uh, the success and the funds, a bit talk about a multiverse similar to Bessem, like a Planescape-esque. Um, yeah, certainly we've, we've thought about it. I mean, so many fantasy ideas out there, right? And we have to look and say, where, where is our best resources to be put? And, you know, we've committed to looking at licensing. Um, and we have, you know, some interesting things that are going to be unfolding over the next little while about the licensing front. And, and then we have all the standards. We are just starting out at the very beginning. Like when you think of Dungeons and Dragons, for example, they got the three core books. Um, well, we don't need it kind of like the, the core anime 5e is the DMG and the player's handbook and one and monster manual we don't really have, but we kind of have a few monsters in there. So there's some foundational things that we want to start out with, like clearly monsters or items or gear that kind of uh stuff is is great because it's it's useful in every game that people can play even if they don't use well uh, i don't have orcs in my world but here's a creature that has the exact same stats as an orc but they're not an orc they're not pigs they're they're based on bears and so they're called borks or whatever um and that they use the exact same stats so th there's that translation and transportability of more mechanical things and we I, I like to focus on some of that to start, but certainly we get into the, the settings, like a, like a multiverse of, of fantasy worlds. Yeah, it lo offers a lot of creativity, um, but there are also so many fantasy settings out there. When you look at what most people are, are kickstarting on, say for fifth edition stuff right now, or in certainly uh, drive through, but, but I'm speaking specifically like Kickstarter. Most of them are campaign type settings. I mean, you get, you get the occasional like, Oh, rules for this, uh, a bunch of inns, a bunch of strongholds. Uh, but a lot of them are going to be the, the custom campaign setting. And so campaign settings are something that people are often create on their own. They're like, well, I love this novel series and love this anime series. So I'm going to create this mashup of Lord of the Rings and game of Thrones and wheel of time. And I'm going to throw in slimes. And that's what they're going to do. And it's that kind of creativity. We, we can't come up with something that's going to be able to match the incredible creativity that that gaming groups have. But yeah, I mean, we, we'd like to do more. What it's kind of come down to is um, capacity and and focus. And we have, you know, as a small company, we have a lot that we want to do. But at the same time, we don't want to flood the market with something um, when there's so many options out there for people that, that want to find it as well. How would the pet monster training class work? Well, Pet monster training class is very simple. You you create a companion. Companions is, is an attribute, and um, you companions think of it like almost like like a goblin or a kobold that's built on so many points. Well, except this is a cute little companion that you have built on so many points, and it's an attribute, and that is now your companion, like a familiar, all right? And so you are going to have this familiar. And then it's going to have certain things that it can do because you put points into it. And then you can also take, there's a monster training attribute. So you can maybe give it some extra features. You're going to you know, instill ferocity in the monster or instill, um, you're going to be able to nurse the monster by taking these specializations that you can do. But in addition with monster trainers, like what, what else can they do, right? Well, they're going to be participating in tournaments, say they're going to be earning money. They're going to have networks of friends. They're going to get items um, like, like a, 
like a pokeball type thing we call the menagerie ball and so they're going to have a lot of different focuses across the field but when it comes to you know if you're doing a throw down in a dungeon they're, they're they're not the ones that are leaving leading the charge with their two-handed sword right that's not what a pokemon or a, a, a pet monster trainer is going to be doing but they can offer a lot of diversity by having these companions uh the pet monsters that they have working for them and so it's a lots of great role-playing opportunities with that but again it's not it's not as combat focused so of course like you know yes pet monsters are can be very combat oriented but they're more tournament combat than you know kill the monsters and steal their stuff how are resources addressed in, in anime 5e yeah so um if you're talking about resources like like money um that, that's one thing. Obviously, we have a coin system, gold pieces and silver pieces, and you can find treasure and, and whatnot. Um, but there's also resources like human resources, as an example, you know, your connections to different organizations. So we have uh, an attribute or sorry, yeah, an attribute that you can get called connected. So I'm actually connected to the Thieves Guild or I'm connected to the... Uh, the city guard or whatnot. And these are resources you can tap into in addition to financial resources uh, that you'd have um, or item resources. So you can create items of power. It's what an attribute you can have is an item attribute where if you want your Mjolnir, like you want your, your kind of epic weapon that is intrinsic to your character or you want to create a particular adventuring gear like a backpack that can that can have a portable hole in it for example to get to other dimensions then you can create those all through the item attribute and so there are many different types of resources and we present uh, a way to do it it's all balanced through points in the end that's that's what's really important money you know is a little bit more free-flowing of course because everyone will determine you know, when you're going dungeon diving, you find treasure. Um, like, what what should you find in a chest? How much gold should be there? Um, or if you're taking a job for someone to go and rescue the princess, you know, what, what should be the rewards involved in that? And how much should an inn uh, cost for a meal or a bed for a night? How much should a horse cost? How much should armor cost? A lot of this is, is narrative. And quite frankly, um, we're not playing a computer game where everything needs to be down to the minutia. It it's, goes with a good feel. And any of the games that, that we find run best is when you're not dealing with the, the counting out the, the coppers, counting out the individual coins. It could be a lot of fun having a low resource, limited, more austere type game. That, that can be a lot of fun. You're playing a bunch of street urchins and uh, um, you know, it's fighting over scraps. It could be a very interesting concept. Uh, uh, Knee Under 7, you know, in terms of an anime example, Knee Under 7 was like, wow, um, you know, waiting outside the butcher shop until it's closing so that you can get the lowest price possible for meat because you have no money. Uh, no, it wasn't fantasy. It was more modern day, but that that style of game could, could be great, but in general, we find that, uh, you know, not worrying too much about the exact price of a, of a plate armor or a horse or whatnot is is a more narrative structure and less about, that, about the specifics of the numbers. Uh, oh, hey, Andrew. So you just popped in. Uh, Dan will ask about wanting to publish a supplement book to uh, Anima 5 v after launch. So, um, well, of course, until anyone gets the rules, they, they, they can't do anything with it um, in terms of expansions and whatnot. But there will be a certain openness to the system, uh, of course. And so we'd say wait until the PDFs are out. And then once you get your hand on a PDF, if there's something you like from there, you can always reach out to us. Of course, if something is open, then you can use it without permission. You just have to attribute it and include in the open gaming license and your product and whatnot. Um, but yeah, c contact us. We're, we're certainly flexible. Uh, we're not we're not big enough to take pitches from all sorts of companies or, or individuals like, oh, I got this idea for this module. I got this idea for this expansion book. Um, you know, we, we're limited capacity for that. But yeah, you know, we're, we're fairly accessible. Reach reach out is what I'd say. Uh, oh, uh, Aaron, you mentioned a slime pet monster trainer. Yeah, that would be pretty funny. And you create humans as your pet monsters. That that actually would be really good. That's almost it's almost like Rimuru. Not 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 that different, perhaps. Um, and how does the Isekai student work? Okay, yeah. So Isekai student. So this is uh, something that when you, when, some of the earlier ones we got was uh, like El Hazard. 
as an example. You cross through and you're, you're, you're students. You come from probably Earth, but you know, it doesn't have to be Earth. It could be anywhere. It could be a science fiction world. But you're crossing over. You are the Isekai student in this fantasy world that crossed over. And so students typically have a couple things. They make lots of connections. So you're going to be forming networks of people. You're going to get followers. Uh, students just happen to, like, think of the student council president. They just get these followers behind them. So you're going to generate, they think of... Uh, um, um, in El Hazard, the Bugram just started following one of the, the main villain characters. And so you're going to have networks of followers, which we have minions in the game. Uh, in addition, uh, Mulligan. Uh, so something that allows you to reroll dice. We, you know, it's, it's an ability, uh, an attribute that you can get that allows you to reroll dice. That certainly is the students are very lucky. So you're going to have that aspect. And then you're going to be learning uh, other aspects of different things you go, whether it's maybe a combat technique or you're going to be getting um, different advantages. I can't remember the entire progression of everything. But an Isekai student is really no different than any other class. We're going to give you certain number of built-in features. Then you're going to have a certain number of built-in points once in a while. You're going to be able to spend points freely. And you determine that direction that your character wants to go. But Isekai students, they're not they're not fighter types. I think I think they're actually D4 hit dice, so you know, very low end. Um, and I know that you know core fifth edition kind of got rid of the D4s and wizards are now at D6s, but we bring in some D4s again. They're like, yeah, these are at the lowest end of, of the score. That's not what they're doing. The Isekai student probably are not running around in dungeons, and when they are, they're gonna be doing what they're good at. So with their connections, their minions uh, that they have with it. Uh, so that's what the, the focus of that is. Almost, you can say, like, Rimuru from the Slime show. Um, you know, yeah, he, he was a student. He was a guy that came here. He wasn't a student, but is a guy. And then he got all these people underneath him, the goblins and the dire wolves and whatnot. And so that's very, very common. We hit some of those common tropes. But the expression of those tropes are completely up to the individual uh, player, what the, how they want to focus on. Uh... Milo, about a stretch goal, can you get more classes as a separate PDF? Yeah, classes, we would consider that. Um, certainly classes take a lot more work and a lot more balancing. And if something was good enough to do kind of as a stretch goal, would it make sense to have it in the core book? I mean, these 14 that we chose, in, in our opinion, were the right 14. But uh, we'd certainly been considering doing one class. We wouldn't do it like a lot of the stretch goals we've been doing, say, five magical items or five mounts or whatnot. Well, we wouldn't want to do five classes. That's just way too much work uh, for a stretch goal and and kind of takes away our focus from, from diversity of other things. But we've been thinking and maybe having kind of a, a little of a different type of class, maybe a little more gonzo, something that we don't think fits as well in the core book, but might be great as a, as a kind of a one-off. Um, and so, yeah, that's certainly something we've been considering. So so thanks for that suggestion. It, uh don't be surprised if it makes an appearance as a stretch goal. Uh, and all right. Well, that looks like pretty well all the questions. Uh, and it has been, you know, we're hoping to keep it under two hours and it's been an hour 45. So I don't really know if there's, there's too much more to talk about. As I mentioned, this was, um, this was for you. This was to ask some questions. I've been talking a lot. And if anyone's sitting through uh, an hour 45 of me blathering on, thank you for that. Uh, you know, I certainly appreciate it. You have great patience. Uh, but I hope it kind of gives a little bit of insight into kind of the design philosophy of what we do. And we know that some people, this isn't what they're looking for. They, they, they might be pledging for it. And when they get the book, they might go, oh, it's not what I thought. Uh, you know, I'm more of a D&D player and, and this is too different or, or too weird. Or maybe I don't agree with some of these philosophies that, that Discami kind of put forward with the game. I don't, I don't think that that is a correct way of doing sizes or whatnot. And all of it's very valid. In the end, once we produce a game, it's no longer ours. It's now yours. Um, but I would just hope that people would approach what we do with, with an open mind. Uh, we're designing things for fun and everything that we've done has been done for a purpose and we have examined things fairly thoroughly. It's not to say we can't make a mistake. I mean, in the end, there's a reason a rat exists, right? Like, like mistakes happen, but we, we have thought of a lot of things and we've, we've run by play testers and they've come up with ideas. You're like, oh yeah, I never really thought we have to make sure we're careful in the wording of that because that could have unintended consequences. Um, but we have been putting a lot of focus on this. Uh, it's based on two really, uh, I'd say, 
well play tested and foundational system with fifth edition and Bessem. Uh, if we kind of say putting chocolate and peanut butter together to hopefully create something better. And that's what we were hoping anime 5e is going to be for a lot of people. So we're really happy with how it turned out. We think it's an excellent product. We certainly want to make sure we get the best product we can for, you know, 3000 plus backers uh, that are looking at that game and, you know, your support has been phenomenal that you've given us for that. So thank you for your trust. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you for spreading the word with your, your gamer friends and uh, your communities out there. Um, this this has been a bit of a surprise for us. And the uptake is, has been really heartwarming. And we uh, we hope that you'll enjoy what, uh, what I created. And, uh, you know, not totally me obviously it's based on fifth edition uh so you know it's it's not as if we designed it from scratch but this particular implementation we hope that it's it gives you a different perspective even if it's not 100 percent what you're looking for if you can just take a couple of ideas for it and it it'll, it expands your your game slightly in a way that makes it more fun for you and your gamers then then we've succeeded in what we want to do uh so Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for spending the time with me tonight. Thank you for, for coming here and thank you for being such a great backer. So uh, I'll certainly, I try to be as accessible as possible on, on the socials and posting on the, the stretch goals and, and other updates as well. So uh, I look forward to, to seeing you around. So thanks for tuning in everyone and have a good night.